So I guess um, today I'm going to give you a bit of a story of my, my journey, but mainly I'm going to focus on how I've sort of grown into being a leader. And I'd never really led anything before I'd started a business. And I have learned so many things along the way. I've made so many muck-ups along the way. And so if I can share some of those things with you today, that's kind of my aim. Um, but just to give you a background, um, I always put this up, so I'm dyslexic, so if you see typos, I'm really sorry. Anyone who's ever emailed me, this is actually on my email signature. <laughs> um, um, and um, just a quick question, who in the room is dyslexic? Amazing. So just so you know, fun fact, 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires. So we're more likely to become entrepreneurs and when we are, we are more likely to succeed. So whoever put their hand up, it's an absolute superpower, so well done you. Um, so I guess quick background. Um, I studied maths and economics at university, but I spent most of my career in the creative industries, primarily working at MTV. And I guess it was while I was at MTV, I just realized that um, there wasn't a place for me and my friends to network and build our careers, like LinkedIn had been designed for that more corporate, traditional community. And so essentially, I, I was never one of those people who wanted to kind of be an entrepreneur. I just literally saw a problem and wanted to create a solution. I wanted a place where I could promote myself, I could connect with others, but more importantly, that I could also connect with brilliant talent, not through the kind of old boys network, but just brilliant, brilliant talent. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, what do I see the problem as? Is LinkedIn was designed for people who wear suits. Um, nothing against suits. But um, for me, it's about creating a space where it really is for that future workforce of people that come up with ideas and execute on the ideas. Um, at the sort of heart of everything we do is, um, I started, started the platform in, on my boat in King's Cross. And we've now grown. Um, so we've got over 8,000 businesses that are now using us to find talent, which is kind of this mental thing to see when you start something and build it out from there. Um, but at the core, as Nadia said, um, you know, I'm a sole female tech founder. I'm also dyslexic. Um, just to put it into context, just before Christmas, I raised a four million investment round. At my level, only 2.2% of funding goes to women. Um, so at the heart of everything we do is around helping businesses build amazing, inclusive, diverse teams. And the reason for that is I experienced firsthand at MTV the problem that comes when you have an homogenous team. At MTV, we were just hiring mates and mates and mates. And our, our kind of injection of skills and talent was just really stale, and we stopped coming up with really great solutions. Um, to put it into context from a tech perspective, as you know right now, most products are designed by primarily male engineering teams. Um, so here's a kind of interesting research piece we did on gender and use of products. So on average, and these are averages, um, women, when they search, prefer on average some, sort of, some kind of signposting when they search. So they prefer like a drop down or some sort of signposting. Men, again, on average, prefer free text search. The problem when you have an all male, primarily male product and tech team is you're subconsciously building products for yourself and not for society as a whole. And that's why I'm so passionate about trying to change that, because otherwise, and to be honest, I'm guilty of it too. I once did a newsletter and my product manager turned around to me and he said, you realize you've only featured work by women? And I'm like, I'm bad too. It's about inclusivity. It's not one, one against the other. Anyway, um, and why am I excited about this space? Well, the robots are coming. Um, has anyone been on the BBC website where you can put in your job title and it tells you how quickly you're going to be automated? <laughs> um, everyone go on it. It will make you really happy because what you do, you're least likely to be automated. Um, so there's three things that machines don't do very well yet. They don't have common sense. They don't have empathy or understand empathy. And they can't mimic that human capability to be creative. And that's why I'm so excited by this space, because creators are the future. Um, I I'm, I'm just wanted to give you, before I kind of go into the more leadership things I've learned the hard way, I just wanted to give you a bit of a background on my journey. So this is my happy sad graph. Um, this is actually my second business. 
I started my first business in Australia. Um, I started a first tech business in Australia. I'm a non-tech founder who decided to start a tech business. Everyone thinks you're mad. Um, and I actually scaled that business into being the biggest network for creators in Australia. I then started kind of an improved version over here. And yeah, this is my happy sad. That's when I'm on cloud nine. I feel like I'm going to take over the world. It's awesome. Um, this is when I'm crying on my husband's shoulder. What the fuck am I doing? I want a full-time job somewhere in language. It's Sunday. It's not it. Um, so, so to an outsider's perspective, I think with anyone who's ever done anything ambitious or anyone who ever looks at a tech company or any company, they think, oh my God, they lucked out. It was so easy. The reality of what I've been through is this. Um, and this is like, this is what happens with anyone who's trying to do anything ambitious with their lives. I mean, I have been the happiest I've ever been, and I've been the saddest and most scared and out of my depth, and I don't, why am I doing this? I, I don't know how to do this that I've ever been. And I, I won't go through the highs and lows, but this is natural. I guess, you know, don't worry when you're on this journey. I think what I've come to do is change my mindset that actually, weirdly, now I start quite enjoying the low bits. And the reason I do is because when things are going really well, I'm not really learning, I'm sort of cruising. But when things go wrong, I've come to reflect on all of these really low bits in my career have been those bits where I have learnt the most about who I am, the kind of leader I want to be, and the kind of person I want to be. And so, weirdly, I'm now like a roller coaster junkie. Um, <laughs> But I guess I wanted to share a few sort of things I've learned along the way. And I guess this is more of a focus on leadership. But I mean, everyone says this, but it's so true. It's all about the team or the people you surround yourself with. Um, I am not, none of what I've managed to achieve would be possible without this incredible team that I, I work with. Um, and, you know, that's the same when it comes to collaborations or everything. I, there's an amazing guy called Claude Williams who runs something called Dream Nation. And he has a quote that stuck with me always, which is, you are the average of the five people you hang out with most. And I just, it re it's so true. And I'm so, in my professional life, in terms of my team is so important, but also in my personal life, it's so important when you're trying to do something ambitious to have cheerleaders around you, people who are going to support you, not that people are going to tell you that you're not going to be able to do what you have the ambition to do. So my core thing at The Dots is we have six very clear values at The Dots, which I learned from my first business were fundamentally important. And our first core value is positivity. And that's not positivity for positivity's sake. I think every leader needs to be challenged. Everyone needs people to kind of set or, or challenge them to take it to the next level. But what I mean by positivity, it's about you need to surround yourself with people that are focused on solutions, not problems. When you're trying to do something really ambitious with your life, having people moaning or politics or any of that setting in is just so corrosive to a business, to a collaboration, to any career. And so I actually now, when we hire, the first thing we do is we check for value fit. Before skill fit, before um, like contacts, before anything else, it's about value fit because the biggest hiring mistakes I've made have been when I've hired someone who's a sh incredible skills on paper, they look incredible, but actually their core values don't match that of the business and that's where things go really wrong. And so value fit is always the thing I look for first. Um, and I'm also looking for people that, that are passionate about what we're doing. And I think this is, this is something that transformed my life but also it's very much that I look for in people now. But you know, where you're gonna win in any career is where you, the intersection of what you love, what pays you well, and what you're great at. If you just do something you love and pays you, um, what, what, sorry, what you love, this is dyslexia, welcome. Um, <laughs> um, what you love and what pays you well, but you're not good at it, it's just a dream. If you do what you love and what you're good at, you're happy, but you're, Deadpool. Um, 
if you manage to get all three intersections colliding, and I've been so blessed that actually at MTV and at the Loop in Australia and at the Dots, I've been operating here, which means I'm properly operating at peak performance because I bound out of bed every day. Like someone said as I arrived, oh gosh, sorry for getting you up on a Sunday. I'm like, no, I fucking love this. Like, what else am I going to be doing? Um, so it never, ever, ever feels like work when you get into that space. It just doesn't. That whole like, have a work, have a life. It's, they both combine, and that's the most magical feeling. And the people I look for to work in my organization, I'm looking for the same. Because then it just means everyone's happy and everyone's building something together that they really believe in. Yeah, five. I've got five. Sorry, I'm going fast. All right. Um, and happiness for me is core to, core to leadership. So my core, my number one objective as a leader is 10 out of 10 happiness of my team. And literally, that is documented. So every quarter, I send an anonymous, uh, not an anonymous, I send a survey to all my team, um, which is completely anonymous, that they fill in. And the first question is, how happy are you coming to the dots every day? One out of 10. Then I ask, what do you love working about the dots? And then I ask three questions that are basically the same. Um, one is like, how can we improve the dots to make you happier? How can we prove the product to make you happier? And what would you do as CEO? And what's been amazing about this process is, one, we're averaging nine out of 10, which is insane. But what I actually love most is I love these. Because these tell me, one, as someone out flight risk, are they gonna leave the business? And then secondly, it, it gives me really great ideas on how to improve the business for everyone. And so anyone who's down here, I will then take for a coffee and we'll chat through like a development program to get them to that next level. And no one who's ever been below an eight that I've done a development program with hasn't got back up to an eight or a nine after that, which has been amazing to watch. And it also means that you have this beautiful, happy culture where everyone is building together. And so that is my core objective as a CEO. Um, the other thing I'm very careful of is not burning teams out. Terrible in our industry. Who's burnt? Is anyone burnt out in this room? Yep, I, I have maybe three, four times. Um, this is one of the, this transformed my life looking at this graph. This is like basically um, that up there is your performance. So the output you're delivering, how good is your output? Here, it says arousal, it's probably the wrong word to say. Don't arouse your team, it's really bad. Um, <laughs> um, this is basically how hard you're pushing your team, how, how much they're engaged, they're taking on new tasks, they're learning. Um, the problem is if you're not trusting your team and you're operating them at down this level, they're bored. So their performance is actually quite low. As you start trusting them more, giving them more tasks, they start learning more things, they start becoming way more engaged, then they start getting into this like peak performance zone. And this is when you're in the flow. It's like, if you need something done, give it to a busy person. The problem is, is a lot of leaders push their team too hard. And once you push your team too hard, what starts happening is they start getting tired, they start getting sick, and actually their performance per hour is going down. So you might be working them six days, but you're probably only getting four days out of them. So I'm very careful with myself now as well, but also my team to really look at when they're getting there. Telltale signs if you start getting sick, colds, anything like that, cold slores, you're basically starting to get into that zone. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but KPIs are the death of innovation. Um, we use something called objectives and key results. Um, definitely watch, there's a brilliant video on Google that will show you it. Um, it was invented by Intel, but made famous by Google. Google implemented OKRs when there were about 20 people in the business, and they really claim that one of the reasons OKRs, Nish, you love OKRs. You used to hate them, right? But you love them now. Love them now. Um, <laughs> Why OKRs? Very quick summary. KPIs, when you're trying to do something ambitious, KPIs, they have to be achievable. The problem is when you're trying to do something ambitious, a lot of the time you don't know what is achievable. So they're more aspirational, but they're also not set from the top down. So basically the CEO isn't dictating what the KPIs are. The teams themselves come up with the things they're doing to achieve the results you want to as a business. So it's a really great model. Um, I am hurrying, I promise. <laughs> um, Another thing as a leader, I've just learned to ask for help a lot. I don't know everything. I, I can't know everything. Um, I have some epic mentors in my life. Um, 
and I don't even really call them mentors, they're just people I had a coffee with and I go to a lot. Um, these are two actually, they're two VCs, which obviously have a bad name, but these are the good ones. Um, Dan is um, the head of talent at the VC firm. He actually built Google um, and after that Skype. Um, ben Grohl invented growth at Facebook. Now they are both incredible men, partly because they are trying to change the industry from the inside out. Um, whenever I have a problem, I have a whole army of people to call up and go, how do I design a share option plan? Well, I call Dan. Um, how do I um, do acquisition retention loops? I call Ben. I've got all these, I've got this army of people to help me. I must admit, I'm going to be honest, I actually have more male mentors than I have female mentors. And I came to reflect on the reason why recently, and I realized that I get about 60 emails a day from women wanting advice, and which means there aren't that many senior, senior women out there. And so if I'm getting 60, they're probably getting 600. And what I've come to realize is that there just aren't enough really senior women, for example, to help because if they had coffee with everyone, they wouldn't do anything else. So actually, what I've come to realize is there's some brilliant white men out there who want to change the industry. They have a lot more time, and I'm punching way above my weight with their mentors. So you can find them, go for the ones that have heart, the ones that have daughters, have a social conscience, and they'll probably give you even more time. It's just a reality, unfortunately. There just aren't enough seniors up there to help, because that's all they do. Um, sorry, no idea. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> I also, most of the time, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I, someone once told me the most successful people do deep learning. Now, this is great for most people, but I'm bloody dyslexic. So trying to read is really hard. But I'm now an audible junkie. So I, um, I devour books at a rate of knots. I actually cycled here this morning on my Boris bike with my speaker on the front listening to workbooks. Um, actually, hilariously, oh, it's not up here. I just read a book called um, Reset by Ellen Poe, which is a feminist manifesto, basically. And I'm cycling to work and pulling up to the lights with this massive, it was, anyway, everyone thinks I'm nuts. But um, learning is so important. Every time I have a problem, every time I'm like, I feel so out of my depth, I just pick up a book because someone, someone else has been through it. And I don't just read workbooks. I find it, my creative inspiration comes from things that are outside just work as well. You know, I'm obsessed with the principle of happiness because I want to make our community happy, so I read a lot about happiness. I read a lot about robots. I read a lot about AI now. So yeah, reading has just become a part and parcel of becoming a leader, I guess. The, so this is Horace, my houseboat. <laughs> the other thing I've learned is I've had to look after myself, which I actually, that was the last thing <laughs> I usually remembered to do. Um, so I now, I mean, I live on a houseboat, which is like my space. I think everyone needs to find a space that makes them happy and calm. And Horace is very much my space. I turn my phone on to airplane mode from about 8 p.m. So no one gets me after that. You know, you have to come up with these things to make sure you stay. Because the most important thing as a leader, you don't burn yourself out as well. Um, so this is my husband, Howard. <laughs> um, I realized that a leader isn't just about managing a team or managing up. It's actually about engaging your partner on your journey. Because one of the hardest things when you're trying to do something ambitious is if you've got someone at home telling you, why are you working late? Why, why are you, you know, basically nagging? And actually, Nish and I were talking about this recently. You've got an amazing hubby that supports you. Sounds like very similar to my husband. But it's not like it just happened like that. I've had to kind of bring my husband on the journey um, I actually gave him business cards that say Head of Special Projects. He doesn't actually work with me, but he, he kind of likes them. Um, and Head of Special Projects means he gets to pay Santa at the Christmas party. Um, but, um, but I think like, it is really important to get your partner on the, and your friends on the journey. You know what? If you're single, it's awesome. So, um, so yeah, my whole mantra is a happy team is a product team. I think with leadership, people forget about happiness. The reason so many companies churn through stuff, they forget that people want to be happy. I think, you know, for me, motivating the team is around making them happy and engaged with what we're doing. And that means you're not only building something that's really exciting, but they're also, it just means you're having fun while you're doing it. And, 
you know, when you're doing something really ambitious and risky, there is a very high chance it will fail, so you might as well enjoy it along the way. So that's my thing. Sorry, Nadia, I ran over.